so we are in our fourth sermon series on the book of Daniel, and so if you'll turn open to Daniel chapter 4, that's where we're going to be. And it's quite an incredible story of, once again, King Nebuchadnezzar, after all he's experienced with Daniel, still believes he's ultimately in control. And a lot of us like to feel like we're in control, right? Uh, especially like in marriages. Like, for instance, I like to believe that I'm in control of the side of my bed staying dry. And I can't tell you, Angel and I just celebrated nine years of marriage, and I can't tell you how many times she's taken her wet towel and dropped it on the side of my bed. And I'm like, Angel, stop putting your towel. It's wet. It's disgusting. I don't want to sleep when it's wet. And she's like, oh, I forgot, I forgot. I basically am flawless in our marriage. I don't do anything like that at all. I'm perfect, and she's just really grateful that she has me. But for the most part, I know, you guys are laughing because it's an obvious joke. For the most part, you know, you're really not in control. I mean, that was one of the biggest things, getting married, is realizing that this person that I'm living with does things differently than I do. A lot of us like to be in control, in control of our home, in control of our things. We like to be in control on the road. Uh, none of us are in control when it comes to driving with crazy people. But there are so many things that could happen that is outside of our control, whether it be a natural disaster or a death or some type of tragic occurrence. And King Nebuchadnezzar here believes that he's actually in control. And once again, God is going to have to remind Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, who appointed you as the king? Who is controlling your destiny? Who is ultimately in charge? And so we pick up Daniel chapter 4. This is about 30 years after Daniel chapter 3. So Daniel was probably in his 50s, 40s to 50s. And as you remember last week, we talked about being uh, a people of perseverance and how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego experienced the fire and God saved them through the fire. Well, 30 years later, we've got Nebuchadnezzar having another dream. And so if you'll pick up in Daniel chapter 4 with me, starting in verse 1. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. This is actually an eyewitness hand account of Nebuchadnezzar. He's speaking this to Daniel, and Daniel was writing it down. It's one of the few actual records that we have in history of Nebuchadnezzar talking about a personal experience that he went through. It says in verse 2, this is Nebuchadnezzar talking here. I thought it good to declare the signs and the wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. Nebuchadnezzar recognizes this is the Most High God, the God of Daniel, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is that God that has worked through my life. He says in verse 3, how great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation to generation. This is so interesting because Nebuchadnezzar is telling us a story about his personal ex experience. When he looked back in time and he says, I want to share with you what God did in my life to bring me to the point that God is the king of kings and he has an everlasting uh, kingdom and his dominion has no end. That's a pretty incredible thing. I mean... That's like Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or Barack Obama actually looking back at their life and saying, I am a true worshiper of God because of what God has done to me. One of the most powerful kings in the world is, is telling us about the God of the Bible. He says in verse 4 that I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house, flourishing in my palace. And I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my bed, and the visions of my head troubled me. He says, I was at the top of my game. I was the king of the world. And you can imagine, we talked about this in sermon number one, how King Nebuchadnezzar had built a city large enough for about 200,000 people to dwell inside. And it had double reinforced walls. So if you can picture this large square next to the Euphrates River with this large tower of Babylon and this enormous structure with hanging gardens, one of the most beautiful cities in the entire world. And you can imagine Nebuchadnezzar from his summer palace just looking out at this city that he had built. Uh, the city that he had won, all the people, all the places. And he is saying, I am just looking at these incredible things that I have done. I am at the top of my game. But then I had a dream. And we talked about in Daniel chapter 2 how God would at times speak to people in dreams. And this dream was enough to cause him extreme terror. 
He says in the dream, chapter 4, verse 6, he says, Therefore I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. The magicians, and magicians are not like Harry Potter here, okay? Magicians were scholars, uh, they would use science. These are the most intelligent people of, of the time. He says, I brought in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. You'd have thought Nebuchadnezzar learned his lesson from Daniel chapter 2. Remember the dream that he had of the gigantic statue? And he asked for the interpretation of the dream, and they said, we don't know even what you dreamed, let alone be able to give you the interpretation. And so he was going to kill them all. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar is not a good guy, okay? He wants to kill people. He burned people alive. We're dealing with a really bad dude. And so he calls them in. And once again, a foolish king asking fools for direction and influence and intelligence. It's the blind leading the blind at this point. And we actually have experienced a lot of that in our own nation, the blind leading the blind. A lot of people, politicians, presidents, think that they have the answers to the future. Think that they can dictate what's going to happen to America by mere politics. One party says, uh, not enough money. The other party says, uh, too much money. And they go back and forth trying to establish policies that will never ever bring healing to people or our nation or our land. And it's a cycle. That happens over and over again. And there's a reason. Because just like Nebuchadnezzar, who abandoned God, who tried to kill off God, so our politicians and the people in office try to do the same thing today. But Daniel, in the story that we're going to see, it's not until you get back into your relationship with God, until you recognize who God is, that you can bring healing and comfort and purpose and prosperity. And so look what he says. In verse 9, Belshazzar, the chief of the magicians, uh, he calls him in here and he says, call in Belshazzar because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen in its interpretation. He looks at this guy named Daniel and he says, call in Daniel, bring in Daniel because I know the holy spirit of God dwells inside of this man. There is no mystery that Daniel can't solve. There is no idea that if you run by Daniel, he doesn't have an answer to. Because Daniel serves the Most High God. What a powerful reputation to have had in Babylon. Remember, Daniel was away from his friends, his family, his home. Daniel was serving in a foreign nation. Uh, and he's pretty much alone other than his close friends. But at 50 years old, Daniel has still ran strong. He is still a man to be recognized for his faith. And so Daniel gets to hear the dream. Let's look at what this dream was, as you saw in the video. These were the visions of my head while I was on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. And the tree grew and became strong, and its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to all the ends of the earth. It's kind of a big tree, if you know what I'm saying. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. And the beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. And I saw the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. And he cried aloud and said this, Chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it, and let the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him, ah, there's our first clue, this tree that's chopped down, let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth, and let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living, this is so important, that the living may know the most high rules in the kingdom of men. He gives it to whomever he wills, and he sets it over the lowest of men. This is kind of a terrifying dream. 
We've got this tree which is strong, it's powerful, it rules over the entire world, but yet the God of heaven sends his Holy One with a message, chop it down, cut off its branches, but let it live. And so Nebuchadnezzar has this terrifying dream, and what better way to figure out what's going on than to ask the man of God. And until our nation, until our lives, until we as people get back to asking the men of God what the direction for the future is, we will have no hope, we will have no future, and we will only live in the selfishness of our own pride. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar is dealing with here. He is this tree that has grown to be the greatest tree in the entire world. But in his loftiness and being so high to the heavens, so to speak, he has become arrogant and prideful and selfish. This is a warning, friends. Not just to Nebuchadnezzar, but in principle, it's a warning to us. Pride is the death of all good things. Pride is like a poison. It can, it can take captive of us at once. Or it can kill us slowly, a little drop of pride every day. And as we grow and grow and grow and become stronger and greater in and of itself, all of a sudden God sends us a message. I'm going to cut you down. I'm going to cut you down. And so that's what Nebuchadnezzar is dealing with here. And so if we could look at the interpretation that, the, that, Daniel, gave, that Daniel gives here. It says in verse 18, this dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. And so Daniel gets to give the interpretation. And look at his response. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. And so the king spoke and said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belshazzar answered, my Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you and its interpretation concern your enemies. I've got bad news for you, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. This dream is not about your enemies. This dream is about you. And you can imagine. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar had burned people alive. Uh, Zedekiah, the king Zedekiah, he actually killed his sons in front of him and then gouged out his eyes as the last thing that he would ever see. Nebuchadnezzar has not developed a reputation for being a very kind human being at this point, right? And so here you've got Daniel ready to give the interpretation, probably scared, uh, senseless, and he's like, it's about you. Do you really want to know? And Nebuchadnezzar says, don't let this trouble you. I want to know what's going to happen. Daniel's like, all right, if you ask for it. And so he gives this interpretation. He says, the tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens, which could be seen by all the earth, the leaves and the loveliness of the fruit. He, and he describes this tree, he says, it is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. For your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven, saying, chop down the tree and destroy it. But leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze like the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This interpretation, O king, is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon you. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall be wet with you with the dew of heaven, and seven times, or seven years, shall pass over you till you know that the Most High God gives it to whomever he pleases and whoever he chooses. He rules, and he gives his kingship, he gives his authority to whomever he wants. And so here we've got this interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to go crazy. And you're going to live like that for seven years until you finally make up your mind God is in control. You're going to go through your trial. You're going to go through your persecution. You're going to go through your tribulation until you finally reach the point in your life where you recognize the kingship, the lordship, the sovereignty of God, and that God is in control. And if we could just glean some things from this point, to look at Nebuchadnezzar's life and to know that are we prideful? Have we become strong? I mean, let's face it. The poorest person in America is probably richest than a third of the world in third world countries. And we have things, we have luxuries, we have food, we have status, we have cars. We've got so many things that we think we have built ourselves. 
Maybe you have a great business. Maybe you're successful at your work. Maybe you've become a great athlete. Maybe you have recognition and you look back with your family and say, ah, look at all that I've accomplished. And you grow in your pride. And we're susceptible. Every single one of us is susceptible to our own pride. And if you don't think that you are, you're probably susceptible in pride in this very moment. If you can't look at moments in your life and say, yeah, I'm prideful. Yeah, I don't want to admit that I'm wrong. Yeah, I want to always be right. When's the last time you actually apologized to someone, for instance? I'm sorry, I need your forgiveness, will you forgive me? These are words and ideas and phrases that give us indicators whether or not we are a prideful person or an arrogant person or a humble person. And so I want you to ask yourself, as we look at the story of Nebuchadnezzar, are there areas in my life that I am struggling with being a prideful person? Are you vulnerable? Are you willing to open up yourself to other people around you and share your weaknesses, what makes you uncomfortable, what makes you doubt, what makes you fear? You see, Nebuchadnezzar had reached a point in his life where the poison of pride had infected his heart to where he could not get rid of his pride, to where he refused to repent of his sins, and to where he absolutely refused to confess God is in control. God is in charge. And so Daniel gives this interpretation. And he says, this is you, O king. And look at the fulfillment here in verse 28. It says, all of this came upon Nebuchadnezzar. And look how long God gave Nebuchadnezzar to change his mind. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. And the king spoke, saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power for the honor for my majesty? Me, 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 this is all for me, I've built it for me, I'm the one that's accomplished this. I mean, think about even the church, right? You know you are living in a prideful church when the subject of the church is what's best for the church and the church alone. You know that you have a prideful ministry leader when that person thinks, well, what's best for my ministry rather than what's best for other people's ministries. You know that you've got a prideful husband or a wife when they live their relationship dictating and making decisions on what benefits them, the things that they can have, what makes them happy. You know you've raised a prideful kid when he goes through life always thinking about himself first and never what can he do for other people or what can he do for his family. When everything becomes so egocentric and about himself or herself, that is a class action case of pride. We should be walking through life thinking, what is best for God? What is best for the people around me? What is best for my church, my family, my husband, my wife, my mom, my dad, my kids? Not what is best for me. Not what I can do for me. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar has done. I have done all of this for me. And as the words fell from his mouth, is what the Bible says, immediately he went insane. Immediately his mind had some type of mental disorder. And whether or not God allowed this to happen naturally, maybe he had certain uh, biological or chemical misfires and that was leading up for that year. Maybe God straight up overrode his free will and just gave him a disease by allowing a demon or Satan himself to attack his mind. Whatever it was, for seven years... He crawled on the ground like an animal, it says, and his nails grew really long, and his hair grew out really wild, and he was actually eating grass like a beast. I mean, think about that for a moment. This man was so prideful that the only way to get him to admit he was wrong, and all you, all you wives are going, pay attention to this husband, right? The only way for him to actually admit that he was wrong was for him to crawl on his knees like an animal for seven years. I mean, think about that. It took seven years to get it through this thick skull. And sometimes it it does actually take a lot of persistence and perseverance for Angel to finally get things through this brain, right? But I'm looking at Nebuchadnezzar and I'm like, I don't want to experience that. God, what is going on in my own life that you could reveal about me? Pride, arrogance, selfishness. Because I don't want to be through that trouble. I don't want to go through that trouble. I don't want to experience that hardship. And here's the wisdom. The wisdom is simply this, learn from the experience of other people so that you don't have to suffer likewise. Learn from the experience of other people so you don't have to suffer likewise. Basically, what did Nebuchadnezzar have to do? Repent. Turn away from your sins. 
And that's a key focal point. This bad man who had murdered and killed and burned alive and poked out eyes and killed tons of people and probably had dozens if not hundreds of wives and he was completely sexually immoral. The key idea is simply for this. Nebuchadnezzar, repent. Repent of your sins. And so in order for the poison of pride uh, to be disinfected and removed from our heart, we too have to repent. Look at Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Here's what it says. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whomever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. You know, if you're ever at work, for instance, and you've messed up on the job, something that you did was your fault, one of the worst things that you can do is try to hide up and cover up for your sins and your mistakes. Say you're at school and you make a mistake. You have messed up. Be honest about it. Be open about it. Say you're in your family, husbands and wives, maybe you've disappointed each other. One of the worst things that you can do is sit there and try to make excuses. Well, there's a good reason why I did this. Well, there's a good reason why I said this. Stop making excuses. Admit your fault. Look, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Let's move on. And you will find that you will have mercy. You see, God cannot stand a prideful heart. He can't stand someone who's going to sit there and try to make excuses for their sin. Simply, yes, I made a mistake. Look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7. Isaiah is dealing with Israel uh, in this moment. And it has a lot to do with the time frame that we're talking about with Babylon. And look at, look at what Isaiah says in chapter 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way. And let the unrighteous man his thoughts. Stop doing wrong and stop thinking wrong, in other words. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You know, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that prevents people from coming back to God. Is they get this idea in their mind that they've got to become good enough, that God won't forgive them, that they've committed too many sins in order for God to welcome them back. But that's just simply not true. The only thing that prevents you from being forgiven is yourself. The, the only thing that, the only unforgivable sin in the Bible is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And it's where you seared your mind to the point where you absolutely refuse to come back and turn back to God. And you say, the things that God did in my life, the forgiveness that he may offer, that's not true. I don't believe it, and I reject it. And so if you're here this morning, maybe you've been a Christian for the majority of your life. And maybe you're struggling with coming back to God. You can rest assured that God will forgive you if you repent and turn back to him. And a lot of people get this, mis they get this mistake and this misunderstanding that repentance means to just tell God, well, God, I'm sorry. And then God gives you forgiveness. Well, God, I'm sorry for that. That's not what repentance is. Repentance is a shift of allegiance from your sin back to God. Does it mean you're going to be perfect? Absolutely not. Does it mean that you're never going to make a mistake? Absolutely not. But it's saying, God, when I mess up, I'm going to turn back to you. God, when I make the mistake for the thousandth time, I'm going to genuinely and honestly come back to you and ask you for forgiveness. God, I need your mercy. That's what it means to repent. And so this dream is fulfilled here. And he comes under this mental attack, this mental disorder. And for seven years, for seven years, he goes through this. Look at Daniel chapter 4. Back to Daniel chapter 4, verses 34. It says, at the end of the time, and this is Nebuchadnezzar saying, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High God and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He who does according to his will and the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? He reaches the moment after seven years of literally hell on earth for Nebuchadnezzar. After seven years of going through the mess, he finally gets it. And he says, God, you are in control. God, you are in charge. It's not about me any longer. It's about you. It's not about what I have done. It's about what you can do. That's the point that Nebuchadnezzar reaches in his, in his life. And the simple reality is, is that he came to his mind when he saw the truth about God, and then he was able to see the truth about himself. 
he came to reality when he saw the truth about God, which enabled him to see the truth about himself. And until you and I are willing to admit we are sinners, we make mistakes, we are lost, we need God. We are forever going to be like nothing more than an animal, crawling on our hands and our feet, eating the grass of sinfulness as we walk according to the ways of this world. We have to reach this moment where we are willing to surrender ourselves to God and say, Lord, you are in control of whatever I'm going through, whatever I will go through. I relinquish to you. You see, Daniel is probably recording this at the will of Nebuchadnezzar. And finally, Nebuchadnezzar recognizes who the true king is. And so many of us live our lives, whether doctrinally or morally, never recognizing that God is the king of our universe. And here's the thing. He'll either be your king today at your choosing, or he'll be your king in the future at his choosing. Either you'll submit to him in a loving relationship of forgiveness and repentance and hope, or you're going to submit to him forcefully as the king of kings reveals himself from heaven, as you're thrown away and cast off forever, all because of pride, the unwillingness to repent and turn back to God. That's the only thing standing between you and him. You see, Israel, <coughs> excuse me, made the same mistake. When they saw the other nations, they said, man, we want a new king. We don't want God as our king. That's what 1 Samuel 12, 12 says. They say, no, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord your God was your king. We want something else. We want somebody else. And God gave it to them. And they left the Lord. And they chose an earthly king rather than a heavenly one. And I want to ask you this morning, have you done the very same thing? Is Jesus the master and the ruler of your life? You see, a lot of people love Jesus as Savior. And trust me, I need Jesus as Savior. I need the forgiveness of my sins. I have messed up more ways than I care to share. I've shared some with you over the past several weeks. And I need Jesus as Savior. But I certainly want to recognize Jesus as Lord. He not only is the king who tells me what to do, but he's the Savior for forgiving me for what I have done in the past. And you can't have one without the other. The Bible says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess in heaven, in the earth, under the earth, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Revelation even pictures Jesus sitting on the throne of, of his father. Jesus is king. And if Jesus is king, that means he has a kingdom that you and I can be a part of. And so is God the ruler of your life? You see, as we bring full circle here, in order to prevent the poison of pride, we must repent of our sins. Peter said in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, repent and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out, may be cleared. If you are never willing to turn away from your sins, you can never be forgiven. That's a condition that God has placed upon us. In order to prevent the poison of pride, like King Nebuchadnezzar, we have got to confess the kingship of Jesus, the lordship of Jesus. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 says this, that everyone who confesses with his mouth that Jesus is Lord, we have to be willing to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. But then something that a lot of people miss out on. You see, we can offer God lip service. We can say, you are Lord, you are Lord, and Jesus asks his followers this question. Why do you say, Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? A true reflection of submission is not in word, but in deed. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. John is writing one of the last letters to the Christian church. He's battling certain ideologies, certain doctrines, certain false teachings. And specifically... He's battling these Christians, not battling in the sense that he's fighting with them, but it's, it's a war of, of ideas, who think that they can just say, I love God and I love people, but that they don't do it in action. Look what John says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? How can you see somebody in need and shut your heart off to that person, yet proclaim to be a Christian. 
How can you see your wife broken, your husband broken, your kids hurt, people around you in physical needs, and you turn your heart off to that person and claim to love him? Look what he says here in verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. King Nebuchadnezzar, don't just recognize me with lip service. Act accordingly. Christians, don't just say, I'm a Christian and I come to church and I show up. Turn away from your sin. Do good to other people. This this Thanksgiving, for instance, is an awesome opportunity to show that what you say matches up with what you do. And what you do matches up with what you say. Giving thanks, being thankful, and sharing with other people in need. You see, it's pride that we battle against, right? I mean, how many times, and I have felt this before, and don't just think that I'm not preaching to myself because I am. How many times have you actually seen a legitimate need, and you think, I need to help that person? But then pride kicks in, and you start thinking about what you need and what you want, and somehow you rationalize in your own mind why you shouldn't give. I mean, think about that. What about even giving back to God in church, for instance, when the offerings pass around? How many of us rationalize, well, I've got to pay this, and I want to do this, and I want to go to this place, and we, we convince ourselves by our own pride that we don't need to give back to God, or whatever it is. You see, C.S. Lewis said this about pride. Pride is the essential vice. The utmost evil is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all of that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads us to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. That's why James chapter 4 verse 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And it takes a humble man to say, I need God. I've made mistakes. I need forgiveness. I can't do it on my own. That is the essence of the gospel. And ultimately, the antidote of pride is trusting in the Lord. You can't lean on your own understanding or your own power or your own will. God is in control. Look what Nebuchadnezzar ends Daniel chapter 4 with. He says in verse 36, At the same time, my reason turned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and my splendor returned to me. And my counselors and my nobles resorted to me. And I was restored to my kingdom An excellent majesty was added to me. And here's what he says. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. That's awesome. All of these things were given back to me, but now because what I've went through, I praise, I honor, and I lift up the king of heaven. I recognize him as the ruler and the author of my life. And look what he says here. I praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways justice. And look at the very hard truth that he had to learn. Seven years of a totally wasted life, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. God is able. And God, I know, has cut your pride down at times in the past, He's cut people in the church's pride down in the past. God is able to put the most prideful leaders at their knees. God has done it to nations like Rome. God will do it to America if we exuviate pride and selfishness and sinfulness. God is able to put people down. But here's what's even worse. The worst part is not just being a prideful person. The worst part is when you reach a moment in your life where God has given you over to pride. Where God has given you over to pride to where he's no longer signaling to you. He's no longer intervening in your life. He has just given you up to do the unspeakable things that should not be done. And that is so very scary because that means God says you've reached a point in your life where you are totally and utterly unwilling to repent and turn back to me. And so what can we learn from Nebuchadnezzar? Repentance, confession. Repentance, confession. But most importantly, The power of God is able to save and forgive and bless only if you're willing. Only if you're willing. And so we're going to sing a song of invitation. I'm going to ask that you stand with me and we're going to pray. And if you are here this morning and you want to give your life to Jesus and there's been nothing but pride that has kept you back, I want to encourage you this morning to let go of being right, of thinking that you're perfect, and accept God's grace. 
as we sing the song of invitation. So let's pray. God, thanks for loving us, for giving us your grace and your mercy. And God, we've all made mistakes like Nebuchadnezzar, and we'd all be lying if we haven't said at one point in time, or even now, we walk in pride. God, I pray that if, if necessary, you would cut us down. You would humble us. But God, I pray that every single person in this room would reach a point in their life to where they don't need that type of discipline from you. They are willing to do it. They are willing to bow the knee. And we know that the Bible promises forgiveness to those who are willing to repent and confess and act out that faith in Christian immersion. God, I pray that every person in this room would walk out of here being aware of their pride, being aware of their selfishness. And God, we thank you and we love you for the gift of grace. We thank you for the act of baptism, the moment where we can receive your forgiveness, Lord. God, I pray that you would give us the strength to be the people that you created us to be. It's in Jesus' name, amen.